started by trying to figure out why this happens. So Kat, do you have any theories on why so many artists hate their artwork at some point? When you're good at something to a certain point, you start to realize that you're not as good as other people. <laughs> and I feel like that is something that all artists will experience when making art. I mean, that's applicable to anything you do. So if you hate your artwork, maybe that's a good sign. Maybe that's a sign that you know you need to improve and you can kind of see where you have to do it, but you're frustrated you're not there yet. So it's a necessary step. Alex, what's been your experience? Why do you think artists feel this way? I think a lot of it has to do with what you said at the beginning of you hate your art in a different way, depending on what your skill level is. <laughs> like when I think of how I hated my art when I was a beginner, like back as a kid or in high school and middle school, I hated it because I could see artists I admired. I could see that beautiful work was possible, but I physically couldn't do it. Like I was just too young. I didn't put in enough hours to be skilled enough yet. So it was that frustrating of seeing that something could be done, but I, I can't do it. Kind of like if you if you hear violin and you're thinking, oh, that's lovely. I want to play violin. It's like, ur, ur, ur. and it's, you're, <laughs> you're angry at it, that it can't work. This makes me wonder, Alex, because you brought up being in high school, being a college student. Do you think a lot of this maybe has to do with age and experience? Because I'm older than the two of you. And I have to admit, I don't feel this way a lot of the time. I get frustrated. And there are things that challenge me, but I don't know that I have that degree of frustration that I used to have. Kat, do you think it's age experience or not? I think that's definitely an affect. Looking back on my artistic journey, when I was younger, the way I hated my artwork then is different from how I dislike my or hate my artwork now. It's different. I think before it was sort of an identity crisis. I thought I'm drawing this thing, but I want to draw like them because they're cool. But now I look at my artwork and I'm like, I draw this way and I want to draw like that just because I, I don't have the repertoire yet. I would like to add that into my repertoire right now. So it's changed over time. Therefore, yeah, I do think that age and experience is a deciding factor on how you hate your artwork. <laughs> Alex, let's jump to the present. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, yeah. what circumstances do you find yourself hating your artwork? I think for me right now, the hatred is much less like Kat was saying, less tied to an identity thing. It doesn't hit me as hard. I would say almost hate is too strong of a word for now. It's rather like dislike or take issue with. I'm like, ah, like that could be better, but like I, it doesn't affect me as much as it did like say when I was an art student and not just my grade, but my future career and everything depended on it. So I had a lot of stock in loving my art, but now that it can be whatever I want it to be, I'd be like, yeah, it could be better. <laughs> <laughs> I like this comment from Seven Angelic who says, the frustration is real. The more I learn, the more I seem to dislike what I do. That can definitely be the case because sometimes when you know more, about things, sometimes that knowledge can be almost poisonous. In fact, I was thinking the other day that I did not grow up with the internet. And to me, the art world was the other 10 kids in my art class. That's all I had to compare myself to. And now I see what everybody has at the click of their fingers. Mm -hmm. And I just think maybe that's too much information. Kat, what do you think? Absolutely. When you see the whole world <laughs> at the tips of your fingers on the internet, that can make you freeze up. That can actually result in you not making any work at all, not taking that leap of faith into creating work. And that's really disheartening and that can really impede your artistic journey. That being said, maybe you should just don't, don't look at the internet. <laughs> just look into yourself and create maybe a bubble or a community with whom you can compare work to, with whom you can talk to, but not compare yourself to the whole world because that can actually make you freeze up. Brittany says, I hated my art far more when I was using social media every day. I don't 100% love it now, but have a much better relationship now that I'm not judging it against hundreds of others' work. Alex, do you ever just turn off social media and art history and just, it's just you? 
all the time recently for a lot, a lot of the reasons that Brittany is saying. Um, I don't know. There's a phrase I like of it where it's like you have something that can like comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Or yeah, if you are feeling like you're not growing and you're getting a little stagnant, that might be time to feel that uncomfortable feeling of comparing yourself to other people's work. Be like, oh, I do have so much more to go. But that can be a lot of pressure too, like you two were both saying. If you wake up every day and you see people half your age with twice as many like incredible work opportunities as you, then it's like it kind of wears you down to the point you don't want to create. Raven's Fine Art says maybe experience, not age. I'm old too and struggle more than when I was younger and was just happy when I made something. I can tell all of you that age has really helped me <laughs> where you just, all your standards, my standards that I had when I was younger that were really high, they just went, and I just went, okay, whatever. And it's rare for me to really get frustrated to the point that it becomes paralyzing. Because I think that's the concern here is that when you have such a strong emotional reaction, you really can just shut down. Has that ever happened to you, Kat? For sure. And just to tackle the age topic, I think that's more applicable when we're talking about I don't know, really young people, because age is definitely something I was looking at when I was in high school. And in high school, I thought, why is my artwork not looking like a certain way? Or why can't I create stories that have the right tone or feeling to them? And a lot of that actually does have to do with life experience. I don't think as a 14 year old, I can write the same stories as I can as a 30 year old, for example. So age in this case does make a difference. But once you get to a certain point in life, you just start to think, ah, oh, who cares what other people think? I think that's at a point where age doesn't matter anymore. At that point, I think it's experience. But going back to what you were originally saying, Clara, yeah, I do freeze up all the time <laughs> when I'm faced with all the wonderful artwork that's around me that I didn't create. But as I said, as I said before, I think it's good to find a smaller community with whom you can talk to, with whom you can, who can encourage you. And I find it's the type of thing that just feeds off itself because, okay, let's say you hate your artwork, you shut down, you look at what other people are doing, you say, but I shut down, why am I not doing that? And it's like double whammy of feeling crappy about yourself. So mm -hmm. let's talk about what are some maybe solutions to this? One thing that I have done is even though I'm always telling people, oh, look what's out there, learn about art history, figure out what's happening on the contemporary art landscape. I do say to people, just don't look at any artwork that's not your own for a little while. Because my issue is that the stuff you read about, it's always the like massively successful artist and it just makes you want to puke. What about you, Alex? Yeah, um, I think as far as how to deal with hating your art, something that was really helpful for me was just honestly changing your mindset on it. Like if you were, when I was at the stage where I was trying to find my style and that hatred was my hatred of my art was like, I feel like it's aimless. Like I'm not going anywhere. It's a new style. Every painting I have, it was really helpful to actually separate real issues you have with your art versus fake issues. Like if you say like, my art's terrible. It's like, well, why? It's like, I don't know. It just is. Then that's a fake issue. That's your mind being too critical of yourself. So if you hate your art, then it's like, great. Tell me in like, use descriptive language. How do you hate your art? It's like, well, I don't know. I'm, my colors are boring. It's like, great. We can work with that. You can work on color because sometimes hating your art is you telling yourself it could be better. So turning that from self-deprecation that keeps you from working into I don't want to say positive thinking, but yeah, make it a tangible critique rather than just disparagement. And making it something that's concrete and actionable. I have a friend mm -hmm. that has really debilitating anxiety, and they said to me that the only way they can get out of it is to identify an action. So if it's something minor, like go to the grocery store and buy this thing, that immediately makes them feel better. Like maybe it doesn't actually fix the situation, but being able to do something specific really helps. Because Kat, I do think that I hate my art. There's nothing I can do about it. That's just the worst feeling in the world. I mean, do you have any actions you take when you're feeling that way? 
one of the actions I actually take is looking back at my past work and seeing where I am currently, because then I can step back and say, wow, I think I'm bad now, but I was really bad then. <laughs> and I'm better now. <laughs> that makes me feel better. <laughs> and I think this action also encourages me to just keep pressing forward because what is the worst art block you can have is just doing nothing. When you freeze up and you can absolutely do nothing. What's important about art making is that it has to be persistent and consistent. So you have to do a little bit every day. You have to keep at it. It's sort of like, as Alex put it before the stream, it's sort of like going to the gym. You're not gonna see results immediately. You have to keep at it. But it's also good to reflect back on where you came from and understand you're only moving up from here. Adam says, I'm in my senior year of high school. Often when I compare myself to others, I can also get a sense of panic that I'm behind on making good work for portfolio and college applications. Now in that specific scenario, it is very stressful because there's a deadline. February 1st, that's when you have to have everything done. But after that, or for people who are not going to art school, a lot of people still feel like it's a race. Oh my gosh, I'm getting behind. Oh, all my other friends are doing this and I'm not there. I'm not even close. How am I ever going to catch up? Or it's too late. Ship has sailed. I can't do that. Have you ever felt that way, Alex? That it was somehow a race to get somewhere? Yeah, and I think it's really smart that Adam is bringing this up now as far as applying to art school's portfolio. Um, because I think the whole art education framework kind of puts creative workers and artists into a weird bubble. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I learned so much from an art education and an art college setting. And <laughs> it's... it's Fat, fit into this mold of like our cultural society of like, oh, you go to school, you get a job, you go to work, you nine to five. And art doesn't do that, really. Um, you kind of grow and develop at your own pace. And it's, I do think, a little damaging to make it that thing of like, oh, well, you should really have your best work done by the time you're a senior in college. And it's like, no, that's ridiculous. Like <laughs> some of my favorite artists, their best work was done when they were in their 50s and 60s. Um, so I know that doesn't help at all with the stress of applying, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it is that thing of just be aware that your personal artistic growth journey is not the kind of thing that can be put on a deadline. And also you can't really go faster. <laughs> a lot of people say, well, what can I do to draw faster? What can I do to finish my projects faster? I'm like, you can't. I mean, you can be more efficient with some of your skills. Maybe you're better at cutting paper out. But other than that, ideation and brainstorming, those are not things you can set a timer to and be like, oh, maybe I can shave a second off of this. It's not like you're an Olympic swimmer. Mm -hmm. There is a really great comment we just got from Trent, who says, I actually don't think it's a good look to publicly say you hate your art. It isn't fair to people who aspire to your skill. I don't like when I see an artist I like say they hate their art. That's a really like beautiful mindset. What do you guys think about that? I like how you put it as beautiful because it truly is beautiful. <laughs> a beautiful mindset that Trent has expressed. Yeah, I actually, I get, I discourage myself from saying I'm frustrated with my art when other people actually compliment my art. I've had people approach me and say, oh, your stories really touched me. And I thought the artwork was wonderful and blah, 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 blah. And once I receive those feelings, I think, oh, I should be compassionate about my own artwork too. Clearly these people like my artwork. Why can't I learn to love my own artwork? So it's sort of like a good reflection on yourself and taking other people's feelings into consideration for your artwork. That's a really big reason why you need to be part of an artistic community. Well, this is a comment earlier from Trent who said, I think some people that say they hate their art are just fishing for compliments. Yeah, because a lot of the times when we do see people's artwork, it is on social media. So there is a public feeling to that. And it's really messed up because it screws with you, which screws with your audience, which screws with how they think about you. And so I don't think you should never admit frustration or say, hey, this painting gave me a really hard time. I think that's very different than 
this collective, I hate it, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that such a general statement, is just not very productive. And so one thing we recommend people do is, hey, sit down and ask yourself, is it the process you hate or is it the product? Why do you think it's important to figure out that difference, Alex? I think that if you identify that it's the process you hate in a way that's easier, like it's like, for me, it's like, oh, why do you hate this charcoal drawing? It's like, ah, because when you put the charcoal to the paper, it like makes that awful sound that like you can feel in your teeth. It's like, okay, then don't use charcoal. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you hate the end product, then that's like, it. I imagine almost like a one of those flow charts. Um, that's like, do you hate the product? Yes. Why is it? Do you <laughs> like the color? <laughs> do you like the size? Like. You, does it execute your story well? And that goes back to identifying real issues that you can change versus just vague issues that you can't identify. Well, I also think that if you don't like the process, that's a good reason to try a bunch of different things. Because I know some people say, well, I wanna be an illustrator. Illustrators only work with this. I'm like, that's not necessarily true. I mean, we had a stream recently where we looked at an artist who worked in collage for illustration. So sometimes you just need a change of pace. Don't do the thing you're, quote, supposed to be good at. Have you ever taken a vacation from yourself? <laughs> oh, all the time. <laughs> I wish I could keep taking vacations. <laughs> but I, I do want to add that I've sort of changed the way I frame saying I'm frustrated with my artwork. Whenever I look, there's something I want to change about every single thing I've done in the past, everything. And I kind of put it that way. I'd say, oh, I enjoyed doing this and this with that work, but I do wish I could have changed that and that. And I think that's a more fair way of looking at your past artwork and your artistic career as a whole. It's more fair that way. And with that, it's sort of like a critique sandwich of yourself. <laughs> something good, something bad, something good. And with that, you can actually progress further. <laughs> it's better than just generalizing and saying, I hate everything. No, there's good and bad things to everything. Also, I think when you take a vacation from what you're supposed to be good at, I like it for two reasons. It's better because it's different. <laughs> Maybe it really isn't better, but it just feels better because it's a change of pace. And the second thing is I lose all my expectations because I can say, oh, I'm not an animator, so it's fine if my animation looks like crap. And I love how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great question and comment from Nicole, who's saying, I'm in high school right now applying to art competitions, and it feels as if other people's successes are my failures. Sometimes and I just, and that I should just do better. Do you have any advice with that? That's a really good question. I can remember that feeling all too well literally even to the last art competition I was in. <laughs> yeah, Kat or Clara, do you guys have thoughts on that one? I can tell you as somebody who has been on those juries and judged those competitions, I honestly think you would get the exact same results if you pulled the names out of a hat. Because basically who wins that competition, it's whether I had a ham or tuna sandwich that day. That It's all just personal taste. And it's obnoxious because a lot of people take that as a sign of their quality as an artist. It's like, no, person A drew a cat and judge A loves cats. And so they picked that piece. It's that shallow sometimes. So I think the better thing, don't judge yourself by situations like that. Hang out in our discord, be around people that really wanna help you and support you as opposed to just slapping a number or rejecting you somehow. Kat, have you found an artistic community been able to help you with that? For sure. I think I have more of a personal connection with the audience who views my artwork when I am talking to this community. Because whoever is jurying those art competitions, whoever's in charge of just picking whatever suits their taste, they're kind of out of my reach. I can't really talk to them. I can't really ask them, what did I do wrong? <laughs> what could I have done better? It's not possible with these people. They're kind of out of they're out of your reach. So talking to a community really ground you in what your audience thinks. It'll also give you a better idea of what a general audience thinks rather than that one jury. Yeah. 
I want to con conclude to you by saying, like, don't um, stop applying to these competitions, but I think change your mindset. Because I remember in high school, when I was applying to them, I would, there was one, like, believe it or not, I applied to this one and I was like, okay, that's it. If I don't get into this art show, I'm not going to go to art school. Like, this is, and I put, I was serious about that thought. I put all of my future plans with art onto some competition that, like, the poor gym teacher had to go to and judge artwork after school, you know, <laughs> like, um, so just view them, apply to them, but view them more as like when you hear authors talking about getting rejected from publishing companies, where it's like that, just the fact of the industry, you get rejected a hundred times for every one time you get accepted. So don't view it as a judge on your quality, view it as just, Oh, got it rejected again. Also, I don't like rejections because they are so black and white. And mm -hmm. I think we all know being an artist is not black and white. There's so many nuances and everybody's their own unique person. And you get the stamp that says like, no, <laughs> it feels terrible. It feels like a slap in your face. Whereas in our discord, maybe you get a critique. You can say to the person, oh, well, why don't you like the color scheme? What's not working? And they can say, oh, maybe you need to do this. And that just feels better, even though it's a criticism. So I think just getting into some situations where things aren't so black and white would be good. And so that's why conversations with artists, as opposed to just entering competitions, is helpful. I mean, like, Kat, how many rejections have you gotten? So many, so many. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing for everyone, no matter what you see on social media, everyone has experienced that. No, everyone has experienced a quote unquote failure before. Nobody publicizes that though. Just keep in mind that behind every good drawing, there's gotta be at least 10 bad drawings behind that. Mm -hmm. Charlie says, I stopped making digital paintings because I hated how my process was so non-linear and messy. Hence I stopped for now. Now I'm exploring other techniques, but mostly I'm going traditional too, thanks to ArtProf. See, that's wonderful. I, I don't think there's enough emphasis on people trying things just to try them. I mean, Alex, have you ever heard people who are like, well, I want to be an illustration. I have to do only illustration and take only illustration classes. I don't even think that's necessarily a good idea. What do you think, Alex? Absolutely. Um, I think especially now when I'm outside of school environment, I'm reminded how the inspiration I would get for my illustration work came from my liberal arts classes I was taking. And so now I'm kind of the same way, like reading history and diving into like weird things like that inspire my art, getting out of that bubble. Like you can't think as that like, oh, like I'm reading the books Pixar animators read and I'm wearing the clothes Pixar animators read and I'm like doing the Pixar animator thing. It's like, no, no, no. Like they, they just did that. You have to now think of another thing you can bring to the table. CC Hem says, I've looked at tons of art, which at least helped me gain a sense of art I find appealing. I was trained to have skills in realistic art that I know I don't want to do. So how do you bridge this gap? Kat, what's your thought? Oh my, we have a lot of videos on Art Prof about finding your personal style. And CC Hems, I think you do need to reference those videos if you want more in-depth explanation on those. But just a brief overview is that it's wonderful that you have the basics down. It's wonderful that you can probably see something and draw it in proportion. It's great that you can render things realistically. But from now on, what do you do with that knowledge? You have to put your own personal spin into it. You have to find your own style. So I would just try to experiment with a little bit of everything and see what clicks with you, whether you enjoy the process of doing something or you enjoy the product of that material at the end. Or if you find other artists whose artworks you like, you can maybe imitate them for a while and then eventually find your own groove and keep going with that. But basically what I'm recommending is just experiment from here on out. And sometimes a process of elimination is very helpful. You can say, nope, I don't wanna do that. There's one thing I can cross off of my list. It doesn't seem like the most positive way to go about it. But I think when I was in art school, I tried illustration. I realized I don't want to do that. I'm going to go try the other stuff. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it helps. Has that ever helped you, Alex? 
Yeah, uh, like especially with illustration of, and sometimes, and it honestly would just but depend on who else was in the class I was taking. If I was in a class that say was more well balanced, had a couple of future animators here, a couple of book illustrators there, and a couple of, like fine artists there, those were my favorite classes because it was a glimpse at how broad the art world can be. But when it was a class of say just little old Alex, and then the rest of the students were say sculptures, then. I, yeah, I felt kind of trapped and like the critiques weren't helpful because it was all pre um, prescriptive of like, I noticed you're doing a children's book. I think it would be a lot better if you did what I do. <laughs> and it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> These are two really good comments about competitions, which I think will make some of you feel better. Evian says, I won in an art show with a piece that was rejected and three other shows. Exactly. It's personal taste. This person likes axolotls. This person doesn't. It's sometimes that idiotic and it makes me mad that it's like that a lot of the mm -hmm. time. And now Slepnir says, I had a chance to talk to a judge and I wish I hadn't. I did not get any great insight. It's better to talk with friends and try to figure things out. Yeah, because I just don't like when people feel that there's only one option. I'm like, there's not one option. There's a million. And it's just, you have to be in a scenario where people are giving you many options. I think what I don't like about the way a lot of stuff is perceived online is that this is the one way to do it. There's no other way to be an illustrator. You have to do it this way. And if you don't do it that way, you're lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of hopping back on those comments too. There's a great one from Maria Kilson saying, that's really important to hear. Sometimes the you can't feel bad, that's just how it is, can feel like your feelings are not valid, but they are. Rejection after rejection sucks, and it takes a tool on you. But it does help to know that you're not alone in it, talking to people who are going through the same thing or have gone through them in the past. I think that strikes on why it's important to constantly apply to those shows, but also have that tight, small artist community. Um, because, yeah, it, one must... Um, as the bard said, be brave, little piglet, and submit your work to things. <laughs> and then instantly, like, run back to your friends, like, oh, my God, I applied to that thing. That was so scary. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, like, it's a nerve-wracking feeling. And it does feel awful to be judged on something you put so much of your identity to. Right. You I, would can't... Also, I would also say, let it hurt, okay? That's fine. This is where experience has not helped me that much. I still get upset <laughs> when I get rejected from things and you go on this trip of why, why? And the thing is, what makes it worse is when you find out the people that did win the grant and you look at their work and you're like, oh, what did I do? That was because you, you sometimes you look at the work and you're like, why? I don't understand, which makes it even more infuriating. And so I, I think sometimes you have to just let yourself be sad be upset, and then you can move on. It's easier to do it that way. Wilbur Vakwa says, anyone in ArtProf have advice for an artist who enjoys their older work more than current work? I just feel like my old work was effortless and expressive, and now the work doesn't sing the same. Kat, what do you think? Reflect on what you were doing in the past and try to replicate it in the future, <laughs> in the present. <laughs> but I would also, <laughs> I'm like, just just go back to what you were doing before. <laughs> but another thing that could happen is just look at what was good about the past and look at what you're doing currently, why you weren't happy with it, but also look at what you're good at and try to combine the two. So you don't have to totally replicate what you did in the past. You can find a new way forward from that. Alex, have you ever looked at old paintings and thought, oh, I was a much better painter five years ago? <laughs> Uh, well, honestly, no, the exact opposite of that. But the, the question did make me think of that perpetual artist dilemma of like, oh, it was much better in my sketchbook. You know, it kind of makes me feel that feeling. And so what you might be talking, you might be in the middle of like a time of artistic change. <laughs> like You could be like in your cocoon about to like butterfly out where you have that older style and the older work you'd make that you like and really click with and connect with. But now it sounds like you're trying new things. And it sounds like, like we were talking about earlier in the stream, returning maybe to the work that you've done after you're exploring these new methods will teach you a new direction that you can incorporate both. 
TMA says, I'm a late starter. Three months in, I see all my mistakes and lack of skill. I've gotten discouraged, but I'm taking my art as this is me at this time with this skill level and trying to grow. That's exactly what you need to be doing because think about how awkward things are when you first try them. Like Kat, I know you mostly do 2D work and your illustration, but I know you did take a jewelry class at one point, which is so different. I mean, how did that feel when you first were in the jewelry studio using all these unfamiliar tools? I felt like I was learning a completely new language because not only were the materials different, but I had to sort of rewire my thinking because before I would think, oh, I just do a sketch and then I ink it and then I'll color, I'm done. But <laughs> with a 3D work, it has to function too. <laughs> so not only did I have to sketch and plan these things out in a 2D manner, I actually had to build, how do I call it, little tests, like out of paper or out of like copper, what was it, bronze, not bronze, I'm forget, brass, out of brass, a <laughs> cheaper metal, and see if it actually worked. So that was a totally different step in the creative process I never even considered when doing 2D work. So it does feel like you're learning a new language and you have to sort of accept like, hey, I'm at level one right now and this is level one work, but, I'm at level one, I'm not at level zero. <laughs> so I'm getting somewhere. And I know this might feel like a more established artist complaining, but things don't ever get to a point where, okay, let's just smooth it. It's not like that because I think we spent years trying to build art craft from scratch. I mean, Alex, do you remember the years where we were just shouting in the void and nobody cared about us <laughs> at all? And I remember being so frustrated. Like, what are we doing wrong? And then when we started to get higher visibility, I was excited, but I also realized, oh my God, there's all these other stresses and challenges of having the increased visibility. Because before I would just write stuff and Nobody was reading it, so it didn't matter. And now I'll write like one thing and there's like five comments, people critiquing the way I said this, this, and this, and I find that stressful. So it's not that any of your issues go away, they just change. Because Alex, I'm sure you have new painting challenges for yourself that you're tackling that are not the same as they were in college, right? Oh yeah, um, like right now I'm having that interesting thing of Hooray, this is like just a season where you can just work on your personal work. That's great. You can do whatever you want. Go for it. Like, whatever I want. Got it. Can do. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that is a unique challenge versus the, hey, here's a school assignment or here's a commission or here's a job. It's like, you, here's your to-do list and go. Now it's like, oh, like, what do I, huh? <laughs> and that's, that, that is a unique challenge that I've never had before. Um, so yeah, like you kind of have to, as you grow and learn, in a way you'll always be in this point of, I hate my work in just a different way, in a different lens. And sometimes you'll hate the process, sometimes you'll hate the product of it. I want to pull up this comment by Jane H that says, I have some ideas I want to turn into paintings, but I'm afraid I'm not good enough yet to do them justice. So I'm waiting, but at some point I'll have to just go for it. That's actually a very tricky balance to strike Whenever I'm talking about making comics, one of the things I like to say is don't immediately start with a book. You have to start with exercises to build up to that book. But at a certain point, you do have to take the leap of faith and start on the book. <laughs> so sometimes it's like, truly, I am not ready. Truly, I shouldn't take that leap of faith just yet. I'm not ready. But other times it's like, yep, you have to take that leap of faith. You have to do it now. <laughs> and I want to ask you, Clara, you, Clara, and Alex, how what is a good judge? When do you judge that you shouldn't start something versus when you should? Mm. I think I hear a lot of artists who talk about stuff they want to do. I think most people have some dream project that's bigger than what they think they're capable of, but they're very excited about. And it depends on your life situation to know when's the best time. But I think if you spend more time talking about it than doing it, it's time to stop talking and just move on or start doing it because that's not productive. How about you, Alex? I really like that. Like the judges, if you talk about it all the time, that's like, nope. <laughs> um, 
I'm thinking of something that you cat actually said at the like really early on in the stream of like you're 14 now like you know how good can you tell that story of being 14 and thinking of like wow I'm only now starting to like artistically quote unquote tell those stories from when I was like a kid so that sense of like I think part of that is like if the experience feels too raw for you to really understand or wrap your head around then maybe it needs to marinate with you a little bit more um because yeah when I think of some bigger pieces that I want to work on now it's like oh I'll do it I have no idea <laughs> it's like I have to kind of think of what lens I want to view it at so yeah, trying. I, th I think that's it, is thinking about how you want to physically make it into reality. And if you have a way to do that, it's time to go. But if you're confused about how the message would go, then maybe marinate. I actually have a story related to that, Alex, that I was reminded of all of a sudden, <laughs> serendipitous. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I remember I was in high school and I was talking to my piano teacher about playing a certain piece. And he said he had tried teaching, I don't know, like an eight-year-old, nine-year-old boy to teach a, to, to play a certain part of that piece. And he said, play it with all the fury in your body. When was the last time you were angry? And the nine-year-old boy was saying, when my little brother hit me, I was so angry. And the teacher said, okay, play like your little brother hit you in that moment. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. I, I think at that point, that boy is not ready to play that piece of music because they just literally don't have life experience and cannot describe correctly how they are supposed to do it. So <laughs> yeah. Alex, that part you said about being able to process and explain that raw emotion is the right time to start making it into art. Hmm. Before and that, maybe you need to marinate a little longer. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I would also add that if you have a big project, you don't have to start big. You can start small. So let's say, Alex, I know you have this comic that you were working on for a little while. You don't have to start painting the final panels. You can just start mm -hmm. scribbling notes in your sketchbook. You don't have to draw anything. Just start gathering information, doing reference photography. And so that might not feel like, oh, I'm doing the big thing, but you're doing something as opposed to talking. I mean, I'm all into action because it's just boring to sit around and talk. Are you in my studio? How did you know what I was doing with that? Because <laughs> that is exactly what I was doing with it. Because I was so excited and eat, like chomping at the bit of like, all right, let's like paint these panels and like, so what do I do with page two? <laughs> like, and, yeah, and yeah, that kind of, kind of all what you and Kat were saying, like for that one, a lot of the story is gonna be about um, without going too deep into it, bigger experiences that I myself have not always interacted with. And so that does involve amount of research and talking with people and learning. Because yeah, at one point, tell your own story, but the other side, everything can't be just an autobiography, you know? So you have to have that broader lens and it's respect of those stories where you have to be like, okay, what is this? What's the angle I want to go about this? And Sometimes working on it in the sketchbook is working the best work to do. Our crop has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a little bit, Kat and Alex will be in the Discord. Oh, actually, no, I guess I'm going to be in there too. <laughs> We're doing a <laughs> stage session. I think we are. I have to check yeah. the schedule. Yes, we are. I like it. <laughs> You know what? I, like I can't even keep track of my own <laughs> slides. So yes, we will be in the Discord in the stage channel, and that's where you can chat with us on voice. It can be about any topic; does not have to be related to the stream. And we would love to see all of you there. Join us, subscribe to our channel, and join the Art Bra family. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. We are so happy to have your support. All of you keep the lights on and make sure we can keep all of our content 100% free and accessible. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.